Counting Coup, a Rainbow Warrior story. If you don't know what Counting Coup is, that will be explained in the story. The first three events were labeled by the press assassination attempts. Four prominent public figures were involved. The three events were spaced one week apart, taking a time total of two weeks to appear. They were called attempts because no one was killed or even wounded, although the shots came close enough to badly frighten the presumed targets. The first one targeted the world's richest media owner, a man by the name of Robert Morgan. The second one targeted two very, very oil-rich brothers by the name of Knox. The third event targeted a famous political consultant and strategist who had been involved inside the previous two Birch administrations before going to work for Robert Morgan's media empire. The third one, being more political in nature, dragged in the FBI, the Secret Service, Homeland Security, the NSA, the CIA, and the ATF. The working assumption was that this was terrorists. The usual authorities got nowhere, except for the odd fact that the investigators kept quiet. In the process of working out from where the shots had been fired, searchers turned up at two of the probable sites, a small cleared area. Each site was an area providing some kind of woods or park-like cover. The cleared area consisted of a circle of bare earth, inside of which was a smaller circle of small white stones, with a cross-like stone arrangement cutting the circle into quarters. In the center of each circle was a small eagle feather set upright. Since eagle feathers can only be legally owned by certain Native American tribes, the Indian experts were called in and identified the small stone circles as symbolic forms named medicine wheels, and which were used mostly by those nations collectively called the Plains Indians. Lots of people had different ideas about what this meant, but there was no other evidence, and the cases went immediately cold, until 30 days had passed since the last of the first three events. Then, in another two-week period, there were three more events. This time the targets were more related to the politics of the Democrats, yet in somewhat the same way as the previous four were related to Republicans. The first one was a sitting senator, chairman of the Ways and Means, the second one a major con con contributor out of the liberal high-tech area around Silicon Valley in California. The third was a former Democratic president. Although no one was hit and the last fellow had a Secret Service detail, the whole thing caused a great deal of craziness media-wide, inside Washington and out. Lots of screaming for action, but since no one was killed or even injured, most of the country was scratching their collective heads in wonder. Investigators found once more the medicine wheel and eagle feather symbols and worked out the following as well. All shots had been taken from about 500 yards out, which requires a certain degree of sniper skill, but not a lot. All kinds of shooters could do this, although why there were no hits didn't make any sense. One of the sites clearly had marks made by the rifle on its bipod front rest which seemed to be teasingly and an intentionally left clue. This, plus facts related to the recovered bullets, led investigators sus to suspect that the same kind of basic sniper rifle was being used in each instance. Probably a Remington 700 cost about $1,200. The reason the cost got to be important was that the rifling marks on each recovered bullet were different which meant different barrels and possibly that each gun was being used once and then thrown away. That's six Remington 700s used once and then discarded. Costly, but makes sense. If no weapon is ever found, there is no way to trace it to its owner. The day eventually came when there were 30 more days since the last three events, which led to the involvement of a lot of government and state police being out and about everywhere. Once more, in two weeks' time, there were three more shootings. This time the individuals targeted and closely missed were two cable news talking heads, one liberal and one conservative. 
The third target was a former Alaskan governor and vice presidential candidate. The one difference which became very important was that the press finally found out about the medicine wheels and eagle feathers. The one-time governor couldn't seem to keep her mouth shut. The authorities had been investigating a lot of former and current AIM, or American Indian Movement, men and women, but to no good effect. All generally had good alibis. While the press and some politicians had been talking about this had to be foreign terrorists, there really had been no evidence, and now with the fact that the medicine wheel, wheels and the eagle feathers finally coming out, the media frenzy shifted in a fairly radical way. That's when a reporter for a daily paper in Great Falls, Montana, had an interview with an old Blackfoot medicine man named David Deerfeather, who liked to drink scotch. What he said changed everything. Guy's got to be counting coup, that's what's going on, David said over three or four drinks in a bar in Missoula. Soon all manner of experts were talking about that mint, of which the consensus seemed to be that Indian warriors did very brave acts against enemies by touching them without killing or wounding them, and then getting away. Of course, not all experts agree, but that wasn't all that David had suggested. Got to be a white man, he said. Probably the rainbow warrior or the true white brother. This last dragged out all manner of Indian prophecies, and the less said about that the better was quoted by so many experts, because for most it was just too religious, and in this secular age that's all we need, some kind of prophecy coming true. Other newsmen, looking David up later, couldn't find him. He seemed to have disappeared, and questions put to other Native Americans in the area of western Montana and eastern Idaho led nowhere. Thirty days later, the targets were religious folks. One was a famous Christian right leader, one a Catholic bishop, and the last was a Jewish rabbi who was very much involved in what some called the Israel lobby. All were clearly political in their public life. The last one led to the discovery of a left-behind shell casing, which pretty much settled the question of the rifle for some, although one investigator remarked that this had to be deliberate and the authorities should be careful because whoever was doing this was smart, careful, and quite capable of leading them someplace they maybe didn't really want to go. The next 30 days event after this last one targeting the religious was a kind of repeat performance, except it was, well, it was one from three of the four former groups. It seemed to be a kind of reminder, and that's when the academic gave his views on the situation. Books had started to appear, trying to explain the meaning of it all. Everyone had a point of view. What was beginning to be clear was something noticed first by this academic in his blog. Many disagreed, but his evidence, based upon polls and similar typical academic social science interviews, was that the tone of political posturing and disagreement, which had been rising toward nearly out-of-control hate speech for some time, was now beginning to abate. People who formerly had been fanning the flames of hateful discourse were now being more circumspect. Takes a kind of edge off of things, the academic said, when someone is out there shooting at you. The folks in the latest target sequence had all gotten more outspoken instead of quieting down, and the Rainbow Warrior, as the media had begun, begun to collectively name him, apparently had gone back to three of them to suggest more strongly that they reconsider their vain and divisive posturing. Investigators did begin to make a kind of headway finally when they started working from the following hypothesis. The shooter was assumed to be traveling the country, buying new guns at the many gun shows and then going to nearby rifle ranges to work out the kinks in the new rifle, which had to be sighted in because each one would have subtle variations and need individual adjustments to the telescopic sight. Gun show sellers were mostly reluctant to give out information and often gave disinformation because what the media had dubbed the Rainbow Warrior was now became, becoming a kind of folk hero, especially after the most recent coup events, which targeted a high-level banker who had escaped prosecution during the market meltdown, a cable TV reporter who had touted a lot of stocks that failed, and a billionaire hedge fund guy who hadn't played any taxes in the last three years. All the same, the ATF investigators 
had some gun sellers and rifle range operators under their thumb because of prior unprosecuted, unprosecuted felony violations that could be held over their heads. The screws were being tightened down everywhere they could be. From these sources, they build up a kind of weirded up profile. The reason for using the same kind of gun over and over again was simply a matter of skill choice. No reason not to have a favorite, and this gave the investigators a lead as they started infiltrating gun shows and the rifle ranges. After a time, they thought they had their man, although it turned out to be a woman. Thing was, there was no weapon ever found and no other physical evidence, and the only fact going for the investigators was this woman buying these same guns over and over again and going to ranges and sighting them in. Consequently, they didn't close in on her, but did start following her and had attached a tracking device to her vehicle. She lived out of this very high-tech off-road camper van that cost upwards of $360,000, one in which she could go into the wilderness and not need anything for quite a while. Shortly after they attacked, attached the tracking device, she disappeared while traveling in western Montana. The tracking device was found by the side of a road. Military satellites were now put into play to see if the vehicle could be spotted, and eventually a compatible heat signature was found in an area of Montana called the Bob Marshall Wilderness. Off-road vehicles were prohibited there, but she seemed to be there anyway. Various agencies decided to try to close in. They were, after all, under a lot of pressure to take any kind of action. By the time they got there, mostly by loud and noisy helicopters, the vehicle was out from under the tree canopy that had previously hidden it and was in the open in a high valley with a large meadow and grassland landscape in its center, surrounded on all sides by dense pine forests.